Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Islam in Focus. I'm Sajjad Saeed. Thank you for joining us. Today's program we're going to be talking about a very important subject. And we're going to have someone who knows a fair, great deal about this subject. Someone who's also lectured about this subject before. The subject that we're going to be talking about is called the end of negative suffering. Brother Khalil, welcome to the program. Thank you. Now, you have talked about this before, as I mentioned, on how to deal with this concept of negative suffering. So can we start by defining what negative suffering is, and what exactly do you mean by it? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yes, um, if we begin with the assumption that um, the natural state of a human being is to have uh, peace and tranquility in their um, life, in their heart, um, then negative suffering can be defined as any form of um, suffering that disturbs this inner peace and tranquility. Anything that takes away from a human being um, his or her sense of peace and tranquility uh, can be deemed negative suffering. Um, this can be for example, uh, stress, anxiety, depression, um, blame, self-pity, and so on. And uh, this is in contrast to, because you might wonder, well, why not just call it suffering? Why call it negative suffering? This is in contrast to what you might call conscious suffering, where a person learns to uh, deal with suffering that is inevitable, uh, such as physical pain or emotional pain, uh, but to go through that without losing their sense of inner peace. Excellent. Now, you mentioned things like um, different forms of ne negative suffering, like blame, worry, anxiety, hate, greed, anger, and, and you know, the list goes on and on, right? We live in an era, I think, that everybody tries, to, tries harder to suffer like that, or thinks of ways. Now, what do you think is the root cause of all these negative sufferings? Well, if we um, just take a minute to first understand um, how human beings um, learn these habits, um, and if you pick up uh, a good book on psychology, you will see that uh, um, these habits are not learned when we grow up as adults. We learn them in infancy. And uh, psychologists will tell you that um, outwardly, their root cause um, is the human mind having created a false sense of self, which is commonly called the ego. Um, and uh, this formation of the ego, this illusory self that the mind produces, and uh, um, it's a lengthy discussion as to how this formation takes place, um, but this false sense of I-ness that actually veils us from knowing who we really are um, can be uh, um, identified as a, a primary cause. Um, so to put it differently, in a layman's language, um, from the time we are born, the human mind creates a fictitious sense of self in the mind that doesn't really exist, a sense of I-ness that is called the ego. And because it isn't real, um, and because from our infancy we're not mature enough to learn that this is not real, it learns all these, if you like, bad habits that it uses to keep this ego alive. Okay? There is another cause to this that is behind the scenes, which is perhaps more real as, as the real cause of, okay. of the suffering. And that would be... Um, um, the heart being distracted from God, if you look at it from an Islamic The course, heart meaning like our the, heart? Our heart, okay. the human heart, whether you talk of it as a spiritual heart or physical heart. Um, some Muslim mystics have tried to show an association between the physical heart and the spiritual heart. Um, but if we just talk of it in terms of the spiritual heart, um, the, the, the drive by uh, uh, Muslim uh, spiritualists and mystics is to teach a human being um, to be uh, single-mindedly God-conscious and uh, to have a heart that is attached to God and not to anything besides Him. 
Um, and as long as that does not happen, uh, the human being keeps uh, uh, looking for happiness elsewhere, and that leads to different kinds of addictions and obsessions and so on. Right. So, uh, to put it differently, outwardly the cause of negative suffering might be the uh, mind-made false sense of self or the ego, um, and behind the scenes, as a result of that, uh, the human being's self-will, uh, which very often opposes God's will, the refusal to surrender, uh, uh, what I frequently say is Islam means to surrender, and, and man's purpose in life is to learn how to surrender. That existence of a self-will that does not agree with God's will, the refusal to surrender, is the root cause uh, of all these different forms of negative suffering. Excellent. So there's a lot yep. of things that you've, you've discussed there. And before we go on, I just wanted to kind of look at society, right? And a lot of the problems that we have in society, um, people are trying to deal with a lot of these sufferings, right? These negative sufferings. So if the guy, um, you know, he's uh, depressed, he might go, oh, I'm going to go to the casino and I'm going to gamble my way and make myself happier by getting money. Or, you know, they, they, people consume alcohol or drugs and things like that. So, you know, those are all things that people use to treat some of these symptoms. I'm not saying everybody does, but in different, um, you know, things, I might, you know, go to the movies to, to feel better. Um, and a lot of reasons why people go to the movies is to laugh and feel better. So these are all the, the you know, they have the symptoms. Each one of us has them to a different extent, and we try to get things to, to treat them with. But what would you do to begin and, and to end negative suffering from our lives and not use these things that are actually destructive habits. Right. Um, because the cause of these uh, different forms of negative suffering um, comes from a false sense of self, not knowing who we really are, the first step that we would need to take towards uh, bringing ourselves to a permanent state of uh, uh, being in peace and tranquility, not really yo-yoing back and forth, you know, as you described, uh, having highs and lows, and um, would be to recognize who we really are, knowing who we really are. And that is why you will see that in Islam as well, there's a lot of emphasis on knowing who you are. We have, for example, a tradition or hadith from um, uh, the Prophet of Islam, peace be on him and his family, um, in which he says, "Man arafa nafsa, faqad arafa rabba." One who knows his self knows his Lord, or one who knew his self knew his Lord. Um, and and uh, one of the meanings we can derive from that is, even if you're trying to understand who God is, or you're trying to understand uh, anything associated with God, the first step is to know who you are. And knowing who you are begins by disidentifying. Um, with the mind, and um, uh, so so, as we identify this as the first way to eliminate negative suffering, know who you are. Um, we would then look at various ways of how you go about knowing who you, when you are. When you mean that, do you mean that I'm not Sajjad Sayed, or or how do you? What, what exactly do you mean by knowing who you are? Because I think I know who I am. Right. But is there a deeper uh, definition of that when you say know who you are. Yes, absolutely. Um, most human beings assume that they are the voice in the head. So that little guy talking. The little guy who's always chattering, yeah. who's always talking, who's always blaming, who's always um, thinking of a past bitter incident. When I see this guy who I had a, a, an altercation or a fight with, the whole drama plays again in my mind or the constant worry about what's going to happen in the future. Um, are we on the verge of a pandemic? There's a recession. What about my RSP, my retirement? You know, that voice in the head that keeps talking. We identify with it completely because that's what the mind has been telling us is the real me from right. the time you were born. Right. Right. Um, so when, when we say you are not um, the false sense of self, um, it doesn't mean you do not exist or that Sajjad Sayyid does not exist. Um, what it means is that if you learn to disidentify from this voice in the head, or from this false sense of self, you will discover there is a real Sajjad Sayyid who is, um, and I'm not saying you are, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> but, but there is the real person who is asleep, who is unconscious, 
uh, or who is veiled from bringing out his full potential because of this mind-made illusory self. And that is why uh, um, Imam Ali, peace be on him, says, Anasu niyamun idha matu intabahu. The people are asleep. When they die, they wake up. Gotcha. Right? So what we try to do is to say, can we experience a death, i.e. death of the ego, uh, before physical death? In other words, can we wake up before uh, you actually have to actually die. you forced to wake up gotcha right uh, and that real person that real self um, doesn't just talk from the mind that real person um, is wise is sage like um, is centered in the heart not in the mind and uh, it realizes and recognizes things truths relationships with its entire being gotcha as opposed to just you know a chatter in the head so a lot of the times i guess what you're saying is instinctively we have a lot of these things within us yeah but when as the ego develops over time we start mm -hmm. to focus on all these other things right. and we get caught up in anxiety and fear right. and hatred animosity right. and all these things are actually mad made illusions but right. when we finally discover who we are yeah. we have this sense of instinct or or heart power i guess right that takes over. Is that, is that correct? Absolutely. And in fact, um, even if we don't uh, strive for this um, enlightenment, if you like, there are certain moments in life where we all experience our real self. Um, and, and that happens when we are absolutely present in the now. Um, the reason is because in order for the mind to keep this illusion alive, what it does is it either needs to <clears throat> live in the past and retell stories again and again, or it needs to uh, live in the future and worry about what if scenarios, things that may or may not happen. Sometimes things happen in life where we are forced to be absolutely present in the now and we have to deal with something now. We can't live in the past and the future. And when that happens, we, we see the real person emerging. Like for example, when a baby is being born, and we are right there when the child is being born. Or when someone is dying, and we are right with them while they are dying. Right? Um, <clears throat> we worry all our lives, how will I deal, for example, with the pain when my parent dies. But when it actually happens, we somehow know how to deal with it. Yeah, no, I, I completely How agree do we it, know yeah. how to deal with it even though we worried about it? It's because the worry was being done by the ego. Yeah. But now that there is no past and future, it's yeah. happening right now. Yeah. The the dealing with the issue is being dealt with the real person. Yeah, that makes And you will also sense. see when a person is dying, the family is all together, there is a lot of love, there's a lot of unity. You're not worrying about anything You're else. You're not worrying about yeah. anything else. And then later on, once the ego snaps back into position, then there's the fight about inheritance and fight about this and that and so on, right? Yeah. So so we all do have glimpses of our real self in life. Yeah. Um, and the idea is to learn certain habits so that we can make this uh, a constant mode in which we live in yeah. so that we are always in peace. Yeah. Uh, it's almost as though um, <clears throat> it's like a movie being played out in our minds. Right. And I guess you have to learn to press that, that pause button and, and, right. and carry on with the rest of your life rather than letting that movie constantly play out yeah. and, and control your life. Would that, yeah. would that be a correct analogy? Yes, absolutely. Except that you don't need to do much to praise to press that, that stop or pause button. Right. A lot of times people will ask me, so what should I do? Yeah. Give me some things to do, A, B, C, D, yeah. right? Um, it's not so much what you need to do as much as you need to just watch the mind while it's playing the games. If you make this a habit, you can actually sit back and watch the thoughts coming into your mind like, a, uh, like, like clouds passing by on a, on a, on a you know, uh, uh, breezy day uh, or, and, and if you do this as a habit, even when anger rises in you, you will watch how your mind is reacting as anger comes in, as desire comes in, as pain comes in, as boredom comes in, as depression comes in, as the need to argue and win every argument comes in, you know, the compulsive need to blame or self-pity. You'll watch the mind and say, oh, there it goes now, it's, it's wallowing in self-pity. Right? And just by doing this, you dissolve the ego and, and you, you, you evolve. Really. Gotcha. So a lot of times, I think when we trust our instincts, our natural human instincts, 
um, they actually lead us to the, do the right thing. But if we always let our mind take over and let these, these forms of negative suffering take over our bodies and our lives, right. that's when we oftentimes get caught up in those right. problems. To a point where many people have come to believe that this is natural, yeah. that we are supposed to go through life uh, feeling uh, anger, yeah. hate, depression, boredom, yeah. and so on. Yeah. When in fact this is not natural, yeah. this is just a bad habit we've yeah. learned from infancy. Yeah. And, and it is possible to uh, attain a level um, of, of uh, um, peace and I, I often say, look at the people you know who you consider to be at peace. Um, their knowledge and understanding of who they really are and of God will be in proportion to that level of peace and tranquility. That makes a lot right? of sense. The more you find a person to be at peace, um, to that proportion you will find his knowledge of God and of who he really or right. she really is. Because a lot of times the people who, who act out in these ways, they might say, oh, I know a lot about God. They know a lot about God theoretically, exactly. but they don't know much about God spiritually because they've never let God enter their right. hearts, I guess. Right. right. So it's a very different scenario. Now, you also mentioned the mind and how it forms an, illusion, an illusionary self or an ego. But the mind is what makes us human and better than animals. Humans have made great progress because of the mind. Now... Is the mind a bad thing? That's, that's, um, that's a very interesting question. The mind can be a bad thing or can be a good thing, depending on how we see um, its role in our lives. If we see the mind as a tool, just like we have five senses, we see this as another sense that we use to analyze, to rationalize, to, to come to conclusion, um, to help others, then it is a good thing. Um, but if we identify with the mind as being who we really are, and we're constantly identified with that obsessive uh, chatter in the mind, then it can be a bad thing. The mind likes to say, well, it's because of me that you know, we're better than animals. But think about it for a moment. A lot of the good things, quote-unquote good things, that human beings have done because of the mind is as a result of solving a problem that the mind created in the first place. Right? So the mind, it, it kind of keeps itself employed. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's a very good yeah. way to put that. The mind creates a world war, yeah. and then the mind creates a United Nations to bring world peace. Yeah. The mind creates machinery to, to, to produce pollution, and then the mind talks about saving the environment. Yeah. Right. The mind creates processed foods that's unhealthy to eat, and then the mind creates medicine to, to cure uh, yeah. diabetes and so on and so forth, right? The mind brings in materialism, greed, uh, um, classes in society, uh, taking the rights of others, poverty, right? And then the mind talks about humanitarian activities to help the poor, yeah. right? So um, the mind can be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I think it is, it is certainly what makes us noble and makes us human. Uh, provided we understand its role in our lives and we are heart-centered, not mind-centered, and we see ourselves um, as having a mind that is a tool, that is a gift from God to use where it's needed to, and not something that we identify with completely and, and, and the false sense of self the mind has produced, you know, as, as being who we really are. Excellent. That's, Otherwise, that's we are enslaved with the mind as opposed to it being under our control. Gotcha. So I guess what we're really getting at is not the fact that the mind is a bad thing, but you need to make sure that you always, or you don't let your ego take over and, and always are doing things to, to uh, you know, feed that if you, you see someone with a, with a nice car, you say, I'm going to get it because he has it. Or you see someone wearing a nice suit and you say, I'm going to get it and get a better one than him. So you're effectively not buying these things because you want them, but because you want to be better than the other person. Right. And then a step further to that is watching the mind and yeah. asking yourself, why do I want this? What is it in me that feels it must get this right. because somebody else gets yeah. has it? Yeah. Is it because the ego feels diminished? Yeah. Uh, and is it because the mind associates the death of the ego with physical death, and that's why it feels it must be better than others in every sense, right? right? Gotcha. Now, one of the methods you mentioned to eliminate negative suffering is to live in the present or the now. But if we're always living in the now, how do we relish the sweet memories of the past or plan for a brighter future? 
Okay, I'm glad you asked that question because when we say living in the now, we're not talking of um, never uh, um, relishing a, a memory, a sweet memory, a good memory of the past, or planning the future. Um, Islam itself uh, sometimes asks us to, to, to look at the past or look at the future um, as, as quick examples. In Muharram, we talk about Imam Hussein and his sacrifices. What we're doing is going back to the past. We're, we're relating what happened in the past. But that's because his sacrifices for humanity and his standing up for justice are lessons we can learn from. Yeah. Right? Uh, you talk about the future. Um, every Muslim is waiting for the Mahdi, peace be on him, to return. So we're talking about the future when he returns and, and, and the peace he brings and the justice he brings. So there's nothing wrong with using the mind to, to uh, go to the past or think of the future um, as long as it does not become a means of churning negative thoughts which is food for the ego. Right. It's when we use the mind to relive past bitter experiences and tell stories and dramas again and again and not wanting to forgive others and not wanting to let go or when we go into the future and worry and stress about what if scenarios that may or may not happen, um, it is that kind of past and future that, gotcha. is, that is being. So you want uh, you want to I guess uh, you want to learn from the past, and and try not to make the same mistakes. Right. But at the same time, if you you've had a problem with someone, don't keep on bringing right. it up. And if we do it right, even when we are thinking of the past or the future, we are in the present. Gotcha. We are aware. We are consciously gotcha. going to the past or the future. Gotcha. It's so not uncontrolled. I guess it's really looking at things effectively, right? Like if if we're living today, we shouldn't spend so much time worrying about tomorrow. But act in such a way, like the the uh, saying in physics goes, uh, cause and effect, right? So if we know what we want the future to look like, we need to do the the right causes now. So the effect in the future will be the one that we want. Exactly. But if we keep on spending time, oh, this is what happened in the past, and we keep on repeating the same mistakes, in the future we'll have exactly what we had in the past. Absolutely. And that's a very universal thing. Yeah. Now, the last question I have, if you could wrap it up very quickly, it's nice to talk about uh, you know, a life that's stress-free and filled with peace and tranquility, but many would argue this is just a, a form of r romanticism almost, and, and it's romanticizing the possibility. What do you think, uh, or why do you think so many of us want peace and tranquility in our lives, but yet so few of us actually find it? I think the reason why so many of us want peace but so few of us find it is because we identify ourselves with the mind and not with the heart. So when we're looking for peace, instead of realizing that peace will come by knowing who we really are, we turn to the mind for solutions and the mind obviously only knows what it has created as an illusory self. It offers solutions that are material and physical. So we tend to look for peace by rearranging the physical circumstances of our life, by finding a new job, finding a new relationship, moving to a new place. But those are not what will really give us peace, and that's why it eludes so many people. It's only by knowing who we really are yeah. and being heart-centered as opposed to mind-centered mind that we can so you gotta, really... A lot of things, I guess, what we've been talking about is all connecting with the heart and mind and, and really realizing who we are. But in conclusion, and maybe you could just you know, wrap, uh, comment on this briefly as soon as I say it, but what, what we really need to learn how to do is, is live effectively today. And, and um, I guess the one, the one biggest thing that's helped me, if we keep on expanding our frame of reference, like our mind is it's like a muscle, right? If we keep on entertaining it, you'll have a very entertained mind, but it's not an effective tool. It's like when we go and exercise and work out, we not only need to work out, we need to diet right, we have to avoid fatty foods and all that kind of stuff. Right. But when, when it comes to our mind, we allow anybody to enter it. We read email forwards that, that have no validity, and we, we, we pollute it to the point that it can't function pop properly, and we have such a big ego. So if you could just comment on that very quickly, um, and, and, and you know, in 30 seconds, wrap, wrap up the program and give the viewer some advice they can take back. Absolutely. Um, two pieces of advice. One, explore the possibility that there is in you something else that can know and realize the truth besides your mind. Okay. That you can sit quietly and realize something with your whole being, with your heart. Explore the idea that the heart can be an organ of recognition and realization as opposed to just the mind. And the second piece of advice is a lot of times we try to grow spiritually by doing things, by helping others, by carrying out humanitarian activities, volunteering in the society community. These are all very good things to do. 
But what is primary is to first take the time to know who we are, and that's an uphill task. And we shouldn't stop doing the other activities we're doing, but never stop searching for who you are and focusing on your self and your soul before Excellent. you help others. Excellent. So I've got some homework now. I've got to go figure out who I am. But I, I, I really appreciate the time. It's a lot of good advice that you've, you've shared with us. But I really encourage everybody to go on this journey of finding who they are so they can effectively become the person that they're truly capable of being. And uh, almost kind of awaken the giant that they have li living within them. So I do thank you guys. Now do visit our website um, and if every, anybody wants some different Islamic literature, we do have some available, mainly the Holy Quran free of charge on behalf of the Islamic Focus team. Thank you and once again we'll see you next time at 10 a.m. next Saturday. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you again next week. Assalamu alaikum and see you again. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Islam in Focus. I'm Sajjad Saeed. Thank you for joining us. Today's program we're going to be talking about a very important subject. And we're going to have someone who knows a fair, great deal about this subject. Someone who's also lectured about this subject before. The subject that we're going to be talking about is called the end of negative suffering. Brother Khalil, welcome to the program. Thank you. Now you have talked about this before as I mentioned on how to deal with this concept of negative suffering. So can we start by defining what negative suffering is and what exactly do you mean by it? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yes, um, if we begin with the assumption that um, the natural state of a human being is to have uh, peace and tranquility in their um, life, in their heart, is the human mind having created a false sense of self which is commonly called the ego um, and uh, this formation of the ego this illusory self that the mind produces and uh, um, it's a lengthy discussion as to how this formation takes place um, but this false sense of I-ness that actually veils us from knowing who we really are um, can be uh, um, identified as uh, a primary cause. Um, so to put it differently, in a layman's language, um, from the time we are born, the human mind creates a fictitious sense of self in the mind that doesn't really exist, a sense of I-ness that is called the ego. And because it isn't real, um, and because from our infancy we're not mature enough to learn that this is not real, it learns all these, if you like, bad habits that it uses to keep this ego alive. Okay? There is another cause to this that is behind the scenes, which is perhaps more real as, as the real cause of, okay. of the suffering. And that would be um, um, the heart being distracted from God, if you look at it from an Islamic The cause. heart meaning like our the, heart our heart, okay. the human heart, whether you talk of it as a spiritual heart or physical heart. Um, some Muslim mystics have tried to show an association between the physical heart and the spiritual heart. Um, but if we just talk of it in terms of the spiritual heart, um, the, the, the drive by uh, uh, Muslim uh, spiritualists and mystics is to teach a human being um, to be uh, single-mindedly God-conscious, um, then negative suffering can be defined as any form of um, suffering that disturbs this inner peace and tranquility. Anything that takes away from a human being um, his or her sense of peace and tranquility uh, can be deemed negative suffering. Um, this can be for example, uh, stress, anxiety, depression, um, blame, self-pity, and so on. And uh, this is in contrast to, because you might wonder, well, why not just call it suffering? Why call it negative suffering? This is in contrast to what you might call conscious suffering, where a person learns to uh, deal with suffering that is inevitable, uh, such as physical pain or emotional pain, uh, but to go through that without losing their sense of inner peace. Excellent. Now, you mentioned things like um, different forms of ne negative suffering, like blame, worry, anxiety, hate, 
greed, anger, and, and you know, the list goes on and on, right? We live in an era, I think, that everybody tries, to, tries harder to suffer like that or thinks of ways. Now, what do you think is the root cause of all these negative sufferings? Well, if we um, just take a minute to first understand um, how human beings um, learn these habits, um, and if you pick up uh, a good book on psychology, you will see that uh, um, these habits are not learned when we grow up as adults. We learn them in infancy. And uh, psychologists will tell you that um, outwardly their root cause um, 